Good. Fantastic. Thanks, Andrea. And um, welcome to this entire seminar, uh, part of the humor series. And tonight's guest is Andrea Medrado, uh, who is at uh, University of Westminster uh, in the UK. Um, and uh, where, where Andrea is uh, a lecturer in the School of Media and Communication. And before that, uh, Andrea was at uh, Federal Fluminense University in Rio de Janeiro. Um, and Andrea has also been a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Oregon. Um, she works in the field of media activism and artivism, the combination of art and activism, uh, especially in the global south. And uh, you'll hear from Andrea's project today about activist art collaboration between Kenya and uh, Brazil. Um, and Andrea is also the current vice president of the International Association for Media and Communication Research. So thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, we're going to hear from you for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, and then after that, we'll have a discussion with our participants. So please, uh, please go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Ralph, for the introduction. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for organizing the event. I'm very happy and very honored uh, to be here talking to colleagues. So um, can you see my slides? Yes, I can see them yes. fine. Okay, great. So um, yeah, Ralph already introduced me. I'm Andrea Medrado. Uh, my talk today is entitled uh, Media Activism and Artivism in a South to South uh, Shared Journey from Fear to Hope. And I wanted to start with uh, some memories that are individual and collective at the same time. It was a bright sky morning in November 2018. It was a different world uh, back then in Rio de Janeiro, where I was uh, living before moving to London. And we were entering the premises of the Marais Museum that you can see in the, in the photo there. This is the first museum in Brazil to be located inside the borders of a favela neighborhood, a favela area or shanty town or a slum. Um, and it was a bit like time traveling, the, uh, visiting this museum to the 60s, to uh, when the first residents uh, started to settle and build this favela, which is called the Favela da Maré, one of the largest uh, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and we were looking at these photos. You can see a little bit of that in the, in the picture that I have in the slide. We were looking at uh, photos of the very first residents to set, settle there, like Dona Orozina. Uh, we were looking at objects, uh, clay filters, uh, furniture, poetry on the wall, and it really me made me think about what it was like, you know, to be an immigrant from a poorer area of Brazil, from the northeast of Brazil, where I'm actually uh, from, or from the rural areas to the big hostile city. And all, you know, made me think of all the hardships that these uh, migrants uh, had faced when, you know, settling this favela. So I remember that the muse museum director, Claudia, Claudia Rose, Claudia Hose, she was taking us on a tour of the museum and she said something that I thought was very uh, striking, that one cannot grow or fully grow as a person without really understanding where one comes from or uh, a bit about his, her history, her past. And um, it seems like a really obvious thing, but I think it was a very important lesson about favela pride and about community projects that uh, place uh, identity and self-esteem um, at, at the core, you know, because for, for them to thrive, these community projects really, really need to, to, to place self-awareness at a very, very important place. So this is why people in Favela da Maré, they wanted, you know, community projects about education. They wanted to learn uh, math, science, uh, Portuguese, of course, but they also wanted to learn about their histories, about their ancestors, about the struggles ancestor, uh, uh, their ancestors' struggles. So this is why they wanted uh, to couple these community initiatives in education with a community museum. And we were in the Maré Museum to do a screening of an animated film called Portrait of Marielle that I will show you and tell you a little bit about. And this film was made by 
Kenyan artivists, uh, so ac artists who are activists, uh, held, uh, they were hosted by the organization pa Power 254 in, in Nairobi to honor uh, Marielle Franco, who was uh, a city councilor who was murdered in 2018 together uh, with her driver. And I'll tell a little bit more about this in a moment. So the event was very symbolic because the idea for making this film came when we were in this museum uh, with a group of academics, students, uh, favela activists, but it traveled all the way you know, to Kenya, across the ocean. Uh, the Kenyan artivists made this piece come true. And now it was returning home to Favela da Maré to be shown to people, to residents of the favela as a piece of animation. And also Mariel Franco, who was honored in this animation, was born in this favela, Favela da Maré. So it was a very symbolic moment. And it was, we could say, favela pride going uh, inter-cross continental. So this talk is about uh, how the narratives of countries in the global south can be transformed when they intertwine. My aim is to capture and to share these instances when this plural, very plural South meet. And we ask, uh, can these work as tools for some kind of a global movement building? Uh, we talk a lot about decolonization these days in the UK, you know, the, a lot of talk about decolonization, decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing the university. But how can a South to South connection be uh, sustained? Um, we have, it's a very challenging question. We have a colonial legacy of fragmented relationships between Global South peoples. In Brazil, for example, authors have asked us to rewrite, reteach, relearn the histories of indigenous and Africans for Brazilians who are direct descendants of these peoples. Uh, because such, such histories were disguised, camouflaged, disfigured, or mutilated, to quote uh, Kizerbo, either by the force of the circumstances, ignorance, or interest. So, for example, I grew up in the Black capital of Salvador, Bahia, and we would often use the word ashe without knowing, you know, very much about its Yoruba roots. Anyway, being aware of these limitations entailed in the South to South exchanges, I will present one South to South um, creative uh, exercise, which of course, it, it was an animation workshop. It would be pretentious to, to say that something like this is challenging the, the colonial order in big ways. But in any case, it, it's a way to demonstrate uh, how marginalized groups in different countries of the global South can use empathy lenses to seek new ways to interpret each other's experiences uh, and perhaps you know, uh, build constructive dialogues between Global South peoples made possible with the use of uh, artivism. So this workshop was part of the activities of a network that I uh, participated as a co-investigator together with Isabella Rega, who is at Bournemouth University. She was the principal investigator. This was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, and the objective was to gather academics, media practitioners, uh, members of civil society, organizations, activists, uh, with different resources, different skill sets, to exchange knowledge on how digital activism can be used to fight marginalization in different Global South contexts. We worked with Brazil, Kenya, Costa Rica, and Syria, but today I'm just going to focus on Brazil and, and Kenya. Um, so there were some key moments for this network. The first one was a kickoff meeting in January 2018. You know, seems like a different world back then at Bournemouth University where all the partners of this network met and kind of set out what the main goals and the main themes of the activities were going to um, be. Then a few uh, months later in May 2018, we had an event organized with the Federal Fluminense University in Rio where I was based before. And the event is started with a, a visit to the Maré Museum that I just described to you, and a debate between the project partners and favela digital activism activists. And at the time, we were very shaken uh, by the murder of uh, Mariel Franco, which had happened in March, a few years, uh, sorry, a few months before the event took place, together with her driver Anderson, because Mariel had been a very strong figure for the digital activists because she was a favela, someone who was born and raised in a favela herself 
and became a politician, a rising star in politics, someone who was very advocate against you know, police brutality. She was very active in the anti-racist uh, struggle, the unfair treatment of the poor. And uh, she was a human rights advocate and, and, and the murder actually remains unsolved. So at the time, Paula Carlos, who is an animation practitioner and researcher, had the idea to use Marielle's story as a narrative thread that could connect the struggles of the Brazilian artivists with the struggle of the Kenyan artivists. So a few months later in August, we had the animation workshop held at Power 254 in Nairobi with a group of Kenyan artivists when they created an animated piece about Marielle Franco, reflecting also on the what, what the two contexts you know, potentially had in common. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. And then a few months later, we had a screening of this animation back at the Marais Museum together with an art installation. Um, and we were very fortunate because the, the filmmaker, the animation director, Nendo Muki from Nairobi, was actually in Brazil for an artistic residency. So she was able to take part in this event and have a dialogue with the favela activists. So we draw from work on activism and emotions and theoretical and methodological perspectives uh, on intersectionality, which stem from black feminist roots, analyzing the interconnected nature of social categorizations like race, class, gender, amongst others, and focusing on different forms of classist, racist, sexist, heteronormativist oppressions and how they're linked and they generate overlap, overlapping systems of oppression. Of course, the, the term uh, intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. In Brazil, uh, the black feminist uh, Jamila Ribeiro proposed the expression, the concept of lugar de fala, which can be literally translated as a place of speech or a locus of enunciation and has reached uh, beyond academic circles in Brazil. And it's basically used uh, to acknowledge the personal, the origin of the person who is speaking in terms of her or his identity, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, class, etc., and how these identity elements inform and shape that person's experiences and uh, worldviews. So the idea is to prompt groups that have historically perhaps been privileged in society to think about these privileges and importantly, um, open up spaces for, for marginalized groups in society to speak out with their own voices about their own experiences. So it's kind of a generosity gesture of acknowledging where people are coming from and giving them opportunities. But the concept has been, of course, criticized um, in a, for being like overly in an overly literal manner, perhaps, that people would not be allowed to speak about something unless they belong to that particular group. So for example, a man could not, could not say anything about the women's struggle or a white person could, couldn't say anything about the anti-racist struggle. But uh, Ribeiro herself uh, has criticized this literal interpretation of the concept. So we're thinking of these perspectives on intersectionality and place locus of enunciation, loci of enunciation as calls for solidarity and mobilization power that can stem from solidarity. If people really make an effort and acquire a deeper understanding of the oppression that different marginalized groups are subjected to, and that can only happen if we get to know each other uh, more closely, so we are back to the point made by the director of the Marais Museum, Claudia, when she said that in order to do anything together, we really have to try to understand who we are and what we have in common first. So I will now illustrate some of these points in relation to the animation workshop that we conducted in Nairobi called uh, Portrait of Marielle. How did we do it? Uh, we started collecting hundreds of images online uh, that we found online of Marielle when she was campaigning and of protests that erupted in Brazil when she was murdered. These images were collected and were printed, hundreds of them as they fall papers or letter sized, depending on where you are. And we asked um, the artists, as you can see in the picture, to manually intervene upon these images. And we asked them, how are you affecting this image? 
And animation works as a sequence, as we know. So if I'm sitting in a group like this, my work needs to be a continuation of the work of the person sitting next to you, to me. The person sitting next to me's work needs to be a continuation of my work. So this created a collaborative practice. And the artists, uh, they had no background in animation as an artistic language, but they had backgrounds in other art forms like graffiti, fine arts, um, and they needed to work together to uh, achieve a coherent single goal. Then all the images were scanned and animated and were used to create the animation. But why did we choose animation as, as an artistic language for this? Because the participants were able to leave their own markings in the original image, and this enabled them to relate to each other as a group, to the message, to the story, to Marielle Franco's story, and to the plot of the Brazilian activists in intersectional levels. So just to give an example, one woman who was a single mother uh, in Kibera, she was drawing a sunflower and reflecting on what it meant to be a single mother, you know, whether you were in Brazil or in Kenya, as a single mom, you have to always be resilient and be chasing the sun. So it was very symbolic because um, the, the sunflower was uh, one of the symbols of uh, Marielle's uh, campaign. So if people uh, can draw on their standpoints, uh, they can intervene upon the images, transforming them into something meaningful. Um, and this creative uh, process enabled the Brazilian, the, sorry, the Kenyan artists to connect to the Brazilian uh, activists in many levels to their sense of grief for Marielle's loss, for their sense of fear. Both countries are marked, you know, by a context of state repression of the urban poor, but they were also able to turn these feelings into a sense of hope during this creative practice. Uh, the soundtrack was based on a Brazilian song called Edoshun, and um, a Kenyan musician did the sort of Kenyan take on it with lyrics in Sheng, and the lyrics talk about uh, how tears can blur our vision, but there is hope so we can still see. So I will now share the um, animation with you. Hopefully it will work. Can you see? Oh no. I need to share my screen. Yeah, you'll need to share that particular. Sorry. That particular. Okay, browser. there we go. I think now. Can you see it now? Uh, one second. Let's see. I think it's. Yep, yeah, there it is. Okay. okay. Hopefully the sound will work. Yeah. Andrea, I'm not sure if if I want to interrupt you, but um, uh, we don't hear sorry. the sound. But I don't know if that's uh, fixable or not. So sorry, we don't hear uh, the we sound. Don't, we we don't hear a sound. Okay. So okay, what I will do is um, I think it's it works better if I just put the link in the chat. Separately. Oh, you can put the link in the chat. Okay. We could we could finish watching the animation. Okay. It's it's, it's short. So yeah. Okay. Right. So now I think the whole thing froze. Can you, can you yeah, see? It's moving. Yeah. It's moving. Okay.
Okay. You're not on my side today because now it's not allowing me to stop sharing or return to my uh, PowerPoint. But uh, anyway. Oh. Yeah, it's asking me to close the Zoom meeting, but I'm really afraid that if I close it, I will leave and not be able to return forever. Uh, let, let me see what we can do from here. Let's Should see. I close? No, no, can let me. Just, if, I, if I play it by oh. side. Zazi alikuwaka wakili wa watu maskini wanaoteso na serikali katili uh, wanatumia vikosi vya polisi kusimamishi ya watu maisha kwa risasi Okay So um yeah I'm having problems now sharing my screen so I think I'll keep talking without the the PowerPoint and then yeah I can't see you. You can't uh, see me. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we could, we could just continue because I think the computer might be having issues, and if we close again, we might end up in the, where we began. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just... afraid of losing, leaving the room, and then not coming <laughs> back ever again. Uh, today okay. is a technology day. Let's just check it with a Gosh, smile. really, it's been like. <laughs> Uh, anyway, okay, so I will keep talking without my PowerPoint. Okay. Um, but you can see me, right? I, I can't see no, you. But, but we can hear yeah. you. I think we, we can, can hear, hear you. me. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'll keep talking then. We'll just, you can hear my voice, hopefully. Okay, so um, we talk about voices, and we can't ignore that the voices of the South, the plural South, as I said in the beginning, are still missing. So this experience represented a way to challenge uh, the fragmented relationships between Global South peoples by tapping the creative strengths of Global South scholars, activists, practitioners. Our aim was to uh, foster relationships uh, and connections, bearing in mind um, our painful colonial histories. And avenues for future research might include further exploring the linkages between intersectional and decolonial perspectives. After the animation was produced, it was widely circulated on social media in Brazil and in Kenya. I took the frames that were used, uh, the pieces of paper that were used to make the animation back to Brazil. And we did an art installation at the Mare Museum that you saw the photo in the beginning of the presentation when I could still sh show my slides. And during the screening, one of Marielle's uh, friends, she said that she was really touched by the way that the Kenyans were able uh, to print their own images in Marielle's um, images. The Kenyan language in the Brazilian song, this connection shows all over the film. This is a quote by one of Marielle's uh, personal friends uh, who was in the, in the event. 
So there, there have been critiques, of course, that intersectional perspectives can be divisive in societies that are already very divided. People start focusing too much on niche groups and start operating in fragmenting ways. But this experience shows that these uh, perspectives could be um, represent a kind of a glue that helped connect uh, different contexts, different realities. And perhaps if people start to reflect a bit more about their own social locations, about their privileges, lack of privileges, uh, their standpoints in society, perhaps they can empathize and connect more with each other. Nyendo Muki, uh, the film director from Nairobi, was able to take part in the event in the MRM Museum, as I said, and it was a, a special moment uh, when she described um, that she felt like Marielle's loss kind of became a collective loss because in Nairobi, people were heartbroken for what happened to Marielle in Rio. So this connection was very strong and it made the piece more intimate, according to Nyendo. People need to know that they're not alone in the struggle, and I'm quoting Nyendo Muki here. Um, they want to separate us, Global South peoples, we become dependent on the North, but we have similar struggles. And if we connect, we can find solutions that can elevate our lives. It's quoting uh, Nyendo Muki, um, which something she said during the event. So a few months um, later, you know, Nyendo was in Brazil. She was doing her artistic residency. And then she decided to carry on with this tradition of the animation workshop. But this time she was funded by another project, by the Get Gete. Institute, and she did a workshop in the city of Salvador, where I'm from, with Brazilian artivists about uh, Wangari Matai, uh, a Kenyan woman, politician, environmental activist, and Nobel Prize winner. And so I think I will just post the link to this animation in the chat because uh, I'm afraid of disappearing or, or losing. I could, I could try sharing it. I could try sharing it from my side or or divine if you're if you're yeah okay yeah okay if you post the link I'll show sure I'll do what's necessary. I let me get the link from the I can get link from my email put in the chat. Sorry, I had everything open here, but that everything froze. I've got it's it okay. here as well, so I can put it in the chat. Yeah, there you go. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Ralph, do you want to show it or do you want me to do it? I just put it in the chat. So yeah, I, I, either way, if you. Okay, let me do it. Then. Or I can I can do it. I've got it open here, Divine. I didn't think you needed to reopen. Here you go. Oh. One And you probably can't see me, right? You can just hear me. I can just hear you at the moment. Okay, yeah. No, the whole thing froze again. 
So um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing it for me. <laughs> and really sure. sorry about these uh, technical problems. So yeah, I'm no, con to conclude, um, when we reflected on these experiences, we started to ask ourselves if these represented transformative moments, to what extent are these uh, empowering relationships between Global South peoples? And it would be, of course, ambitious to claim that these relationships are easily sustainable. I mean, it was it, it, it's, it was a very challenging project in many ways because there's so many barriers to start with, of course, language issues, funding issues for South to South partnerships are very difficult. Um, for example, the funding that we used for this project has just been axed in the in the UK, just to give you an example. But uh, we hope to, I hope to have demonstrated the, the way in which artivism was able to facilitate dialogues between uh, Kenyans and Brazilians and some seeds of empathy being planted in this uh, eco project with efforts to learn and value marginalized people's strengths, ancestries, histories, stories. And we see also that artivism uh, transform, of course, artists represent cultural resistance, resistors, sorry, very valuable. And the creative practices that they piloted uh, built communication uh, repertoires, including ways to build media knowledge. So the process was transformative, I would argue, for all actors involved. We were able to embark on an emotional journey from fear to hope to a feeling of connection and solidarity. And this journey is what allowed our activists to call themselves our artivists. So despite all the challenges, South to South collaborations open opportunities for explorations of mutuality. Yes, this might sound a bit uh, idealistic in times of a global health crisis and which are worsening the already existing uh, severe inequalities that we have in the world. Uh, but I want to focus on these collaborations as a starting sort of humble, uh, humble starting point. And um, one way to maintain the legacy of those who fight for social justice is to share the stories, to share these stories from the margins. And this visit to the Marem Museum and this experience taught us important lessons. Let us not forget the faces, the names, the objects, the poems of the Dona Orozinas of the world. Let us not erase the people who built their lives in the shantytowns, peripheries of Brazil and many other Souths. These stories are connective. These connections are transformative and these transformations can be powerful. That's it. Thank you so much. I'm sorry about the technical problems and uh, um, well, hope you were able to uh, follow what I was saying. And thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea. And uh, yeah, um, sorry, our side as well for for technical issues that uh, the gremlins that have appeared. And I think we're responding in a spirit of Gambiaja, trying to uh, <laughs> cobble together a solution from the available uh, available technology. So yeah, yeah thank, you very, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, we've, we've corresponded before, uh, before this with um, uh, about our shared interest in art, art and activism and South-South collaboration. And so I've been, I've been very interested to hear more about your project today. And um, could I just check with one of the co-hosts? Is my um, uh, is my video pinned? Because uh, I'm still seeing um, Andreas, but that could be at least from my side. Okay, great. So yeah, that's um, I was actually in Rio directly after the assassination of Mariela Franco um, in in 2018. And I remember how it really uh, ignited and uh, all the all those ideas about uh, racial harmony in Brazil, or sort of it brought that to the fore. The the idea of you know whether Brazil is a sort of a colorblind country, and of course it isn't. And it was highlighting uh, the issues of inequality between black and brown and white in Brazil, and it was connected to the Black Lives Matter protests in the U.S. as well that had been going on for a few years beforehand. And I saw those um, the favelas in, in in Brazil, and I remember being struck by these very fancy elevators in Rio that would take people up to the favelas. So you had the sort of high tech entrances to uh, to to the favelas. And I commented on your photograph of the museum, the Marais Museum, 
that it reminded me of the work of a, an architect and artist called Marietika Potric, who does these installations that are based on informal informal shelters and, and dwellings. So there's an interesting overlap there. But um, yeah, let's let's take questions from the the audience and anything that people would like to discuss. I think you've really laid out some interesting groundwork around a very hybrid project uh, that involved Kenya and Brazil. Um, and there's certainly more things that I could input to it, but uh, let me hear from the other participants here. Is there anybody who would like to uh, make a comment or ask a question of Andrea? Yeah, Wang Wangui, if you could uh, unmute. Yes, perfect. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Andrea, for this uh, presentation. And I, it's somehow connected. In, it made me remember some of the work that uh, a community organization I'm involved with in Kenya does, forging links with uh, a group called Papohetu in uh, Complexo di Mare and an organization called Rio and Watch in Rio. And I've, I've shared the link in the chat if you're interested in that work. But my question is, uh, in uh, part of obviously the challenges and we've also experienced challenges, like you said, the language barrier funding. Um, I was wondering how in view of these challenges, how you sustain these relationships, because I think a core objective of your presentation was to talking about sustaining or the, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so maybe if you can talk about a bit about how your efforts to sustain these efforts beside, beyond the uh, animations uh, for activism to, you know, build off and feed off uh, each other. That's all, thanks. Thank you, uh, thank you, Wangui. Um, Andrea, would you like to respond? Uh, asked to unmute, okay. Um, Andrea, are you there? I think she muted herself and uh, no. I'm, I'm clicking the ask to unmute button. Yeah. I think the challenge is that she might not even see it because of uh, her computer uh, is freezing. So maybe I can write it in here. So presumably Andrea can hear us. Um, in the meantime, well, perhaps we should take another, uh, another question or comment if uh, Job would like to, to discuss. I know Job has been really looking forward to Andrea's presentation um and really interested in the media activism space so job okay uh, thank you raf and i hope andrea can can hear can hear me and um it, it was a very exciting pre presentation um andrea um I, I didn't... i'm back okay great did, oh, did you sorry drop... about that i could yeah, hear just... you i was trying to okay, talk good. But then you, you, I don't think you could hear me. Okay. okay. Should I yeah. answer the question? I got the question. Um, yeah. Let, uh, jo job, should we come back to you in a second after Andreas responded to Anguri? No problem. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the question about sustainability, I think it's um, such a huge challenge and sometimes it's it's quite frustrating because you start these projects and it's quite frustrating sometimes to be to be to be like perfectly honest to 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 go back to participants particularly um from vulnerable communities so money i'm sorry uh is 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 important to make things happen you know you cannot you cannot expect uh favela, for example when i'm working with favela activists uh, at the university to ensure that people are paid uh, for their participation, for their knowledge, for their talents. So it is, it is so challenging. This, this project was funded by a British uh, grant, which of course make this uh, a little bit uh, ironic as well. 
then the fund that we had in the UK to fund these kind of projects has just been axed. But uh, in any case, what I'm trying to do now is uh, to find more funding, to find more grants, to find more ways to uh, to carry on uh, working because I think it's it's really important. One good thing is that with social media, people connect with each other directly. So we could see already that some connections have been fostered. Uh, I know Nendo, for example, is very active. She's been talking to a lot of people in Brazil, working together with them. All kinds of partnerships are being uh, fostered. But um, yeah, of course, the issue of funding is um, a very, very tricky one. And I think if there was another question, I missed it. Sorry. No, no, no problem. We'll ask Job to, uh, to, to start again, because I think you were changing over when he started speaking. So Job, please go ahead. Uh, Job, by the way, Job's been really looking forward to your presentation, because this is an area that he also is uh, very uh, invested in. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure, Andrea, I've, I've really been looking forward to this presentation. Um, I recently completed my PhD and I was um, doing um, a study on uh, digital activism in Kenya, but uh, focusing on uh, uh, political movements. And um, it, it's very nice to see um, how you've made an inter inter intersection or rather an, a connection between Kenya and Brazil. And um, I, I can think of so many Mariel Franco um, in, in Kenyan context, uh, who have also been, you know, assassinated like uh, Jacob Juma, like Oscar Kamau, like Paul Oulu, and, and so many others um, uh, who come from even where uh, Wangoi um, works at uh, MSJ. Uh, but um, th the question that I really wanted to, or rather a view that I really wanted to get from you was the issue of, of you know, uh, activism about change. Uh, do you think um, th there's a way in which, you know, such uh, activism that you talked about, uh, media activism and activism, can be scaled up to bring about the real, you know, real issues or real change, uh, for instance, policy change or, or even a review of laws? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a really good question, a challenging one as well. I mean, uh, we were talking earlier about Coletivo Papu. I mean, I'm going to speak about the uh, the Brazilian context uh, that I'm obviously uh, more more familiar with. But some of these uh, collectives, activist collectives that we worked with in Brazil, they've been campaigning for so long. For for example, policy changes in terms of uh, police police brutality or state repressions in in favelas. And earlier this year, we had a victory in a way, although it's not, it's 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 now sort of yeah okay I'll come back to that in a moment. But the uh, the Brazilian Supreme Court decided to stop as a result, I think, of all the campaigning that has been done for so many years by favela activists uh, in different parts of Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, connecting with Black Lives Matter movements, with international movements. So the, uh, tr the superior, I think what would be the equivalent of the Supreme Tribun tri Tribunal or Court, uh, Supreme Tribunal in Brazil, um, ruled that it would not be allowed to have police operations in the favelas during the pandemic because that was also a very serious issue. People are, of course, dying in, in Brazil everywhere and in the favelas, you know, it's, it's a very critical uh, moment. People are also very hungry, like hunger has returned. And then these police operations continuing and the favela activists are always, always talking about how they're dying of hunger, uh, of disease and of being shot, you know. So they decided to stop like, okay, let's suspend all police operations in favelas during the pandemic, which was really celebrated. But recently we had again a police operation in a very big favela in, in Rio with uh, resulted in a lot of deaths of, of, of innocent people, which basically disrespected this. But in any case, I think that yes, some 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 changes are are coming, although of course they're they're very slow. And I think another thing is that we really can never take things for granted. You know, I, I think this is this is the tricky thing. Like we take sometimes five steps forward and then we have to take many back and and, and carry on going because we can't really take anything for granted. Uh, sometimes the achievements are, 
are lost, you know, all of a sudden, as we are seeing with the with the current government. But uh, of course, there's uh, enough, lots of strength, lots of to power to carry on. But um, it's 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 a long, long journey and a difficult one. Thank you, Andrea. I see a few a few questions in the chat, and I think maybe I'll just um, read out read them out. Um, and if you want to make a note of what they of what they are, you could maybe answer a few. Uh, together, if you, if you'd like to do that, or I can remind you. But uh, Dom uh, Dominique has asked, could Andrea share with us how the different identities of the women who are honoured in the South South projects were perceived in the various national contexts? So the difference between Brazil and Kenya, and how uh, the identities of the women were honoured. Um, we have a a question that sounds like it have a complicated response. From Nabil, uh, who's asking, what 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 is your view, viewpoint on Jacques Rancière's theorization on aesthetics and politics, and how relevant is it to such intersectional contexts? That's the second one. Um, and Piwakazi is uh, commenting on the way that Black people in Brazil are hidden and that they don't occupy positions of power, and so she's wondering if Marielle's murder has uh, fostered fear around being outspoken about issues such as police brutality. So that's the three, three points. And then we'll come to Fernanda, who's got her hand up. OK. So yes, thank you for the comments. Uh, Nabil, about uh, Rancière's, I'll be very honest. No, I haven't uh, considered Rancière's theorization. Uh, but thank you for the suggestion. Maybe something worth looking into, definitely. So thank you. This uh, thing about Brazilian people being hidden, yes, of course, like um, I think Ruff was saying earlier, um, how the whole discourse of the racial democracy, you know, Brazil as a racial paradise where the races are mixed and live in harmony, you know, has been completely de 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 demystified. This, if, you know, if you look at people who are in positions in power and, and absolutely in, in politics, I think this is very, 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 very evident. Uh, at the time that she was killed, Marielle was the only black woman uh, in, a, in a position as a city councillor in Rio. Uh, and if we think about, I think Brazilian women comprise about 25% of the population. I mean, black and brown are actually the majority of the population, statistic majority, and still, you know, so invisible in positions of, of power. Uh, but yes, of course, like I think Marielle's um, murder was one of these moments that really shook the the whole country and on one hand yes fear like um i i my i was working with uh, lots of uh, black women researchers and i think all of us were like wow this is a message you know this is a clear message shut up like if you're a black woman if you're a woman but of course if you're a black woman this is much worse don't dare becoming you know powerful in politics just shut up stay in your place, stay in the favela, don't dare to do this. It was a very, very violent message. But I think at the same time, um, the, the activists, you know, have been really brave. And I've talked to them about this, like that if they thought that they were going to shut up, then the result was actually the opposite. You know, people have carried on and been very outspoken. And I think Marielle's murder called such a such an outrage and, and, and it, it, it has been mobilizing and still is. But of course, fear is always there, including, to be honest with me, like I felt very, very afraid sometimes, something that I hadn't experienced before. So fear sometimes is a very, can keep you, you know, frozen, but um, at the same time, the activists were, were, were fighting very hard to overcome this fear and to, to carry on um, working and to carry on talking, to carry on fighting. Uh, okay, was there okay. another? The first, the first one from Dominique, I think, is re is referring to um, the women being honoured is Marielle Franco and Wang and uh, Wangui, um, and how, if that's what you meant, Dom, and uh, how were they, how were they perceived in the different national contexts? So how were they perceived ah. in, in Brazil and in Kenya? Yes, I think it was a very powerful experience. And when we started the project, the idea was to work with marginalization in general. Like there wasn't really a gender element, like this idea to focus on, on women and on powerful women. But when Marielle was murdered, I think that became very, very clear to us that it was very important, you know, to speak about 
women and women of color, you know, black women in Brazil. And when we did the uh, workshop in Kenya, I, I talked to the artivists about what Maria was fighting for and what she represented. And I think a lot of commonalities uh, were found. Like they were talking, for example, about the struggle of the youth in cities, uh, being unemployed, uh, being surveilled. Um, you know, of course, Kenya and Brazil are very different uh, contexts, but the issue of how the media, the representations of the media in both countries representing, you know, the poor as the, as the criminals, uh, of the city and this kind of rhetoric and discourse that anything that must be done, you know, to ensure safety, if it means killing, you know, in Brazil, black people in the favelas, then then be it, you know, and, and that was justified in some ways. And I think that this also resonated uh, with the Kenyans in terms of uh, Marielle's struggle for 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 the black youth and and the the favela youth. In, in they they were able to find lots of commonalities and I think that's why the piece was so strong and in Salvador I think I wasn't I didn't take part in the in the workshop that Niendo conducted in in Salvador but I was following it on social media and with the people in Brazil I think this I this idea of uh, honoring the African ancestors is really really strong really powerful and you know, they 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 were saying that you know that they didn't know about Wangari, that they didn't know about Kenya, but they also felt very connected about what these women are uh, represented in their countries. So I don't know if I answered. But... I think so. Thank thank you, Andrea. And so let, let's go to Fernando, who's got a, a question a question for you or a comment. Should I put my video? On? Hi. Oh, yeah. Fernando. Oh, Fernanda. <laughs> thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the afterlife of the animation itself. And you mentioned in your paper that the, the journey of the animation goes back to, uh, returns to Complexo da Mare. And you mentioned that in a way that they completed a cycle by returning uh, to, to, to the beginning of this process. But I wonder whether the animation has traveled to other places and um, if you could speak a little bit more about how audiences uh, in different places um, you know, have interacted with the work and whether or not you take into consideration uh, the reception of this artwork produced in the project as part of, of the project itself and uh, what we could, you know, what have you done about that? Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you so much for the invitation as well. Um, yes, yeah, so this um, the the animation was shared um, on social media via the project, you know, profiles. And I think the uh, the filmmaker Niendo she um, sort of echoed this film quite a lot. Um, outside of Brazil in Kenya, to be very honest with you, I don't I don't know of any. Uh, circumstances in which it has circulated. I know that it's it's been shown in like film festivals in Brazil, particularly film festivals um, for 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 black Brazilian filmmakers, black filmmakers. Niendo was in Brazil. She presented it, and she's had, she's been showing it. And of course, together with Wangari as a kind of a echo project that she was calling, she had the the idea to keep carrying on doing more things like this. But then, of course, the project finished in two thousand nineteen and the pandemic hit and yeah, that of course changed, I think everyone's uh, plans. But um, in terms of the reception, I think it's always uh, in Brazil, in Kenya, I don't know, very, very, very emotional in these in these circles. But at the same time, I, I remember talking to Nyendo about, um, she also got some kind of uh, awkward reactions because Marielle was a political figure so, uh, you know, she came from a particular party associated with the left wing party. So, for example, some comments saying things like, I don't see how, because I, I think it's been showing circles about, for example, social change, these kind of topics and people questioning, why is this social change, you know, this political, the fact that this woman is a politician, um, people were like questioning it and sometimes like saying some, some you know, of course, people who are kind of uh, more aligned with diff ideological views in Brazil. We have a very pol polarized mo political moment in Brazil now. So there, she, she also got a few like 
strange reactions like why is it that you're honoring this woman specifically um you know this is this is this is very ideological and things like that uh and yeah and in terms of considering audiences i think that's that's a really good idea we weren't really able to do it but it could it could be like a I guess a next step to think how how do people react, you know, to these figures, to these women, and the way that they are being honored. Uh, how do they interpret it? How do they make sense of it? How do they connect with it? So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So I think we have we have a chance for one one more question, um, which I see in the chat, and then we should we should wrap in the next uh, in the next few minutes. And it's Eugene. Um, and Yazin is asking, uh, how does this dialogue address the current issue of restitution? Not really directly at the moment. No, but I think it's a very important one. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Andrea. That's been a really interesting presentation. And um, you're very cool under pressure. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> For, uh, I'm very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it probably shows. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. So, uh, so yeah. Thank you very much. It's been it's been great. Thanks for spending this time with us. Um, and uh, next next week we'll be back at the the same time, 5 p.m. Uh, South African time next week Thursday, with uh, Patience Masusa, who's from the Nordic Africa Institute, and she'll be talking about um, issues around uh, mining in Zambia. And she'll be introducing a chapter from her upcoming book, which is coming up in uh, in 2022. Uh, so thank you, thank you to my colleagues. Thanks, Divine. Thank you to the rest of the uh, crew at Humor. And yeah, thanks again, Andrea, and uh, to Fernanda for uh, for curating this uh, the speaker. Thank you so much, really. Thank you so much. I was very honored to be here. And I'm sorry if I kept like freezing and losing my screens. I hope I was able to make some sense here. <laughs>